Squint is also known as strabismus. Now look at this image over here. You can see this eye is a bit elevated compared to this one. So what is orthophoria? It means both the eyes are parallel. These two eyes are parallel to each other in all the gazes. That is orthophoria and this is a hypothetical condition. None of us is orthophoric. Okay, All of us have some amount of squint present. This we are going to term as heterophoria. Heterophoria is squint. You can see in this picture the two eyes are not parallel to each other. Okay, This is called heterophoria. It is further divided into two types based on the visibility of the squint. It can be either tropia or phoria. Tropia means the squint is visible. As soon as you look at the patient, you can understand that he has a squint. However, in phoria, you cannot uh, uh, make out that the patient has a squint. It is latent or it is hidden. Okay. Based on the direction of displacement, it can be exo outward, esotropia inward, hypertropia upward and hypotropia downward. Okay. Similarly, applies to exophoria, esophoria, hyperphoria and hypophoria. Now, let's look at these in detail. Exotropia, see the eyeball moves outwards. Esotropia, the eyeball moves inwards. Hypertropia, the eyeball moves upwards and hypotropia, it's moving downwards. See, all of these are in the primary gaze. The normal eye is in the primary position. See, the patient is looking straight, but there is deviation of the deceased eye. Now, in tropia, the squint is manifest, as we just mentioned, and it is clearly visible. In the affected eye, the side needs to be demarcated. In this, okay, it can be either the left side or the right side. However, in phoria, the squint is latent. You can't make out the squint. We can only notice the phoria when it converts to tropia that is manifest squint. That happens when the eye is under some kind of stress. So phorias are usually seen in children. So when the child is angry or crying or distracted by something else, the phoria becomes evident and converts into tropia that is when you can see that the child is having a squint. But you can't wait for the child to get distracted always. So, let's do some tests. First, let's look at what you will do for a tropia. It's a very important test called the Hirschberg's corneal reflex test, also known as HCRT. Okay. As you can see here, there's this yellow dot in the middle of the uh, fundal reflex. Right? That is the light, flashlight that you will put onto the patient's glabella and ask the patient to look at the torch. Now, this reflex of the light falling on the cornea, if the patient does not have a squint, is located in exactly the center of the pupil. As you can see in this picture, it's beautifully located in the center. However, if it moves out or in, you call it heterophoria, right? Because of the deviation, the reflex, the light, the light falling from the torch onto the cornea will not be in the center of the pupil. It will be diverted from side to side. And it is important to measure the distance. So, let's assume this is your eye. Okay, this is the deviation present. If this is the center of the pupil, the light will be shown somewhere here because the eye is deviated. And the distance between the center of the pupil and the deviated light reflection will give you the magnitude of squint. So, each mm of decentration equals 7 degrees of squint. Okay, 1 mm decentration is 7 degrees of squint. And another usually commonly used term is prism diopters. So, 1 degree of squint is equal to 2 prism diopters. So, if a patient has 7 degrees squint, he has 14 prism diopters of squint. That is how you will calculate. Kindly memorize these calculations. 1 mm decentration is equal to 7 degrees squint. That is equal to 2 prism diopters. This is the formula. Okay. Now, cover and uncover tests. This is used for 4 years. You cover the patient's eye, suspected patient's eye with such a Thing. 
you cover the eye and then the procedure is you will flash the torch onto the forehead of the patient and ask her to look at the light. Now what happens is the eye under cover will deviate will show its deviation, it will reveal its deviation. However, when you remove the light, it will come back to the center. That's the whole thing about Fourier's, right? They are hidden and to get them out, you will have to cover one of the eyes. See, look at this picture, you will understand what I'm trying to say. In primary gaze, there's no deviation as you can see. But when you place a translucent cover like this, see, you can see that the eye is deviating inwards. Right? That is the latent squint is becoming manifest. Okay? And again when you remove the cover, it comes back to the central position. Similar thing is happening to the left eye of the patient as well. So, when you remove the cover, if the eye has deviated in, to come back to its normal position, it will move out. So, when it's moving in to out, the patient has esophoria, just like in this picture. Now, just opposite to that, if the patient's eye is deviating outwards under cover and you remove the cover, it will move inwards, back to the center, right? Is it clear? That is exophoria, okay? Out to in is exophoria and in to out is esophoria. And as you can guess, in orthophoria, there's no movement of the eyeball. And most of the phorias do not require any treatment. Okay, so let's try and concentrate on tropias. Now, tropias are of two types committant and incommittent. Committant means together, and by definition, the angle between the two eyes remains the same in all nine gazes. That is the definition of concomitant squint. That is the angle of deviation between the two eyes remains the same. And it is of two types, accommodative and non-accommodative. Because the angle is same, there is no functional problem to the patient except for the cosmesis. As such, the patient does not have any issue. However, in incommittent squint, the angle between the two eyes changes with every gaze position. It is further divided into paralytic and restrictive. Now, because the angle keeps changing in all the gaze positions, the most annoying kind of, uh, complaint of the patient will be diplopia. And to compromise this, he will have an abnormal head posture along with vertigo and disorientation. These are the complaints in an incommittent squint. Okay. Let's learn in detail about concomitant squint. The first type is your accommodative squint. It occurs when there is an uncorrected refractive error. Now, children are usually hypermetropic and when you don't correct, when they are highly hypermetropic, the eye is overcompensating to increase the visual quality. Because of that, the eye deviates inwards. Okay, this is called accommodative esotropia and most of the hypermetropes have convergent squint and myopes have a divergent squint. If you don't correct it, myopes have a divergent squint and hypermetropes will develop a convergent squint. The beauty of this is that as soon as you prescribe the appropriate glasses, see the vision is corrected as well as the position of the eye comes back to normal. Now, as opposed to this, non-accommodative, you can guess that there will be no improvement with glasses in non-accommodative squint. It occurs due to high fever or a trauma or some chronic disorders. Okay, And because it is not improving with glasses, your only way of management will be a surgery. We will learn what this recession and resection mean in a bit. But... Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sai Suguna, your mentor for ophthalmology at Medico App. Now, thanks for watching the video. Now, we have put such videos all together in our ophthalmology app. The trial version you can download from the link over here or in the description box below.